גדול הוא הלילה, ולך מחייך, חזן הוא ליבוקר, אל שמש. June 5th, 1967, 7.45 a.m. Israel delivers a stunning opening blow in the Six-Day War. Within a few hours, the Israeli airstrike has devastated the Egyptian Air Force. Fighting on three different fronts against the combined might of three Arab armies, Israel would win a war in the space of just six days. How did this tiny nation achieve one of the most astonishing victories in the history of warfare? In early June 1967, tensions in the Middle East were rising. Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser had called on the Arab nations to destroy Israel. War seemed inevitable. Israel faced the grim prospect of a simultaneous invasion from Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. The combined Arab armies had a massive superiority in numbers of soldiers, tanks, and fighter aircraft. The general mood in the Arab world was that Israel is not that strong. It could be defeated. Yet against most expectations, the opposite happened. In less than a week, Israel had defeated its Arab neighbors. How was such a stunning victory achieved? To understand the reasons for Israel's victory, it's necessary to go back to the early 1960s. At that time, Yoash Sedan was chief of planning in the IAF, the Israeli Air Force. It was pretty obvious that not later than 68, they will eventually attack. A military coalition between Egypt and Syria meant Israel would be facing battles on at least two fronts. It could expect attacks from Egypt through the Sinai Desert and by Syria from the Golan Heights. And it seemed possible that both Jordan and Iraq would add their weight to the Arab force. To fight a war the way it wanted, Israel would need to gain air superiority. Once the Arab air forces had been dealt with, Israel could fight each of their ground forces in turn. These classified plans have remained secret for 40 years. They reveal how Israel would achieve air superiority. The primary objective would be to keep the Arab air forces on the ground. By disabling the runways of the Egyptian air force, and then the Syrian, etc., etc., you prevent the aircraft from taking off. Targeting the runways would take hundreds of Arab aircraft out of the equation. The plan was good, in theory. But what were its chances of success? We had a problem there. They had tens of runways, more than 50. We had only 206 aircraft. The problem they faced is a scenario the Israeli Air Force trains for to this day. How could the IAF keep enough of their aircraft in the air to destroy all their targets. NATO used to consider three missions per aircraft per 24 hours the maximum that can be done. But was this really the limit of what could be achieved? A bright staff officer in the Israeli Air Force was running some numbers one day and realized that the Israeli Air Force could turn around an aircraft after a mission in six to eight minutes. Everything would depend on how fast the ground crews could work. They did so many exercises and drills to reload and refuel the aircraft that it took them up till seven minutes. If the ground crew worked to the limit, each aircraft could fly up to five missions in one day. But for such an operation to succeed would still involve taking an incredible risk. In the mid-1960s, Yalo Shavit was one of the leading pilots in the IAF. 
He would train many of the pilots who would carry out this operation. In the squadrons, we had the photographs of most of our targets. Each pilot had to learn and remember by heart the direction of their runways, the amount of runways, the control tower, the storage of bombs, all the targets in the base. For more than two years, the Israelis practiced this operation, codenamed Moked, meaning focus. Ground crews competed with each other to see who could turn around a fighter fastest. Pilots bombed dummy air bases, modeled on the layout of the real targets, and were constantly tested on their ability to memorize every detail of their mission. And they had to concentrate in one target, and they knew it by heart. You wake them up in the middle of the night, they knew what, what target they are going to bomb. Preparations for war on the Arab side progressed at a different pace. The army was always used as a tool to maintain stability in the country uh, and, and uh, against political opponents. It was not really uh, preparing itself for any kind of serious confrontation with Israel. Despite this less intense preparation, on Sunday, May 14, 1967, Egypt made its move. President Nasser deployed his troops in the Sinai Desert and then closed the Straits of Tehran. Israel's access to the Red Sea was cut. The Middle East was on the brink of war. On the morning of Monday, June 5, 1967, Israel fired the first shots in what would be the Six-Day War. Egypt was hit by a massive preemptive airstrike. Squadrons of Israeli jet fighters swooped down on Egyptian air bases. Unable to take off, Egyptian aircraft were sitting ducks. Had the decision to send Israeli soldiers home for the weekend caused the Egyptians to relax their guard? You use as much deception as you can possibly apply so that the Egyptians will be looking elsewhere when the blow comes. To succeed in such an operation, you need three things. Intelligence, intelligence, and intelligence. Intelligence gathered on the Egyptian Air Force routine was critical. Israeli aircraft approached Egypt flying fast and low over the Mediterranean, 500 miles per hour at an altitude of just below 100 feet. In less than 12 hours, the Egyptian Air Force was virtually wiped out. On top of that, hammer blows had been dealt to the air forces of both Syria and Jordan. Israel had achieved air superiority. Their ground forces could now take center stage. The focus of operations would be the Sinai Desert, where the borders of Egypt and Israel meet. A vast expanse of difficult terrain, much of it impassable sand dunes. It's typical of the fearsome weaponry that faced the Israelis in the Sinai Desert. Within the space of 48 hours, hundreds of these tanks would be knocked out by Israel's much smaller forces. How was such an unlikely victory achieved? Each Israeli division that goes into the Sinai faces two Egyptian divisions. Behind those two Egyptian divisions is one more Egyptian reserve division. So that means the Israeli divisions are fighting with a three to one disadvantage. Within 36 hours of the Israeli attack in the Sinai, the Egyptian armored divisions were ordered to pull back. During the retreat across the Sinai, the Egyptians suffered thousands of casualties and lost hundreds of tanks. The damage was beyond any imagination. We never thought that we could do this kind of damage. These blackened, twisted lumps of metal were once a mighty Egyptian division. What kind of power could have inflicted such all-consuming destruction? On Wednesday, June the 7th, Egypt's armored divisions were retreating west towards the Suez Canal. Their routes took them through three mountain passes. In that state of panic, they were all trapped in the three passes in the Sinai and became a sitting duck for the Israeli Air Force. Yet for the Egyptians, the nightmare of their Sinai retreat was not yet over. How could two armies, both used to such conditions, perform so differently? Before the march starts, the platoon medic checks the conditions his soldiers are going to encounter. When soldiers are on the march, they have to drink about between five to six liters before the march 
They start six hours before and they drink every hour one liter. Strict water drinking regulations were implemented by the Israeli army in 1959. Up until that point, the need for soldiers to avoid dehydration was appreciated only by medical officers such as Ezra Sohar. In these days, the army used to issue one liter of water per day per soldier. Sohar and a team of military medics decided to conduct a unique experiment with a group of soldiers by marching the entire length of Israel in August, the hottest month of the year. Every day, they covered 17 miles with hourly rest breaks to take on water. We found that the person in a very hot area, if he works physically, the amount of sweat can reach up to 20 liters a day. So to make up for it, we suggested that they drink one liter every hour. By the end of the march, the benefits of regular water intake were plain to see. These soldiers, they were in excellent condition. They said, we are ready to continue indefinitely. The difference was the drinking. By Friday, June 9th, the Egyptians had been driven back across the Suez Canal. Israel had captured Jerusalem and the West Bank from Jordan after two days of bitter fighting. Yet the Israeli and Syrian armies had still not engaged. The theater of war would now move to Israel's northeast border with Syria, the Golan Heights. This mountainous area was vitally important because it gave Syria a near impregnable defensive position. But by Saturday, June 10th, Israel had taken the Golan Heights. Much of that success came down to the Israelis' ability to hit concealed Syrian artillery positions. How did they know where to strike? The answer lies in the extraordinary story of Eli Cohen, Israel's most famous spy. In 1961, Cohen's brothers, Abraham and Morris, were kept in the dark about his real life. We do know that Eli is doing something for the government. Cohen was working undercover in Syria for Mossad, the Israeli secret service. And Cohen's upbringing in Egypt helped maintain his cover. He was a Jew who came from an Arab country, and he knew very well Arabic. Cohen, agent 088, was known in Syria as Kamal Amin Tabet. He became close friends with General El Havez, the president, and incredibly was appointed a member of the country's high command. But what had Cohen's espionage actually achieved? One famous story recounts that after Cohen's tour of artillery positions on the Golan, he made a strong recommendation to the Syrian high command. He says, those guys are suffering from sunburn and heat casualties. We must do something to protect them from the sun. Nothing is too good for our boys in the field. Plant trees by every artillery emplacement. And they do. They plant trees by every Syrian artillery emplacement on the Golan Heights. And the Israelis watch these trees growing up, telling them exactly where every Syrian artillery emplacement is. But around the bunker complex today, there are many mature eucalyptus trees. This would suggest that Eli Cohen succeeded in helping the Israelis to pinpoint Syrian artillery positions. Though Cohen died two years before the Six-Day War, he undoubtedly influenced its outcome. By the morning of Saturday, June 10th, the Syrians had been finally driven from their bunkers on the Golan Heights and were retreating to Damascus. The Six-Day War was over. In less than a week, Israel had defeated first Egypt, then Jordan, and finally Syria. But was this really Israel's brilliant military triumph? Again, it seemed as though it was a divine appointment in time. Jerusalem was to be restored to the Jewish people after 2,000 years. The enemies of Israel had twice as many soldiers as we did three times as many planes, four times as many tanks. The odds were stacked against us on every military front. The love of Israel, self-sacrifice, 
and courage of the Israeli soldiers, combined with divine guidance and assistance, made these miracles possible.